to start. Based on the fact that I can't seem to get it started on time, we're going to try to here today. Um, yeah. Um, so we have Arlene Zortman. Here. Carrie Snow. Here. Glenn Pepper. Here. Jenna Reed. Here. Melissa Berry. Here. And then staff we have um, Lauren Sully. Here. And your Daniel. Here. And Sarah Arden. Here. Thank you. Okay. Everybody had a chance to look at the minutes from October 8th, and if so, I need a motion to approve. Glenn, second. Jennifer. All in favor, say aye. Okay. Opposed? The minutes are approved. Okay. Any public invited to be heard? Uh, scare up some people here mm -hmm. these days. It's always fun to listen to what they have to say. Um, organizational updates. Just bear with me, sorry. I'm not I'm not mentally prepared. I had some family stuff happen at the weekend. Well we were supposed to have a long weekend and straighten it out. Um, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> so, you know, as you guys know, we've had a lot of positions open recently. We've had some um, shift in the staff. We've moved, since I came on board, we've promoted people. Uh, we have one person, we have a couple people resigned, we have one person terminated. Um, we're currently seeking some needed staff. We hired one who started today. Um, but you know, just overall, I would say that we're just we're still kind of in that fluctuation period, trying to run down the staffing. Um, it's kind of creating a bit of a pressure squeeze on us. And, um, you know, and, and we've got some people out on leave, uh, parental caregiver leave. We have people on medical leave. Um, so it's been a difficult few months, um, and I'm really feeling the stress. So, um, so thank you for your grace and your patience today because I am going to do the best I can. So um, was it the regional partner then or the assistant to have the um, So we made an offer to someone for the regional. Okay. They accepted. Okay. And yesterday, yesterday we sent it. Oh. So we are back to. Um, so we have some some discussions to have internally about <laughs> what we're going to do now. Um, How are you doing on maintenance? Because we're down to two right now. We have okay. one on vacation. Patrick's still on leave until December third. We had to let them person go. We hired one today. We're hiring one more. We have more interviews happening today or tomorrow. Um, so we're, we will be fully staffed once we hire one more and everybody's back. Um, by December 3rd, we'll have the full team. And we're already prioritizing our unit turns um, and the, the contract that we're going to do with the ARPA money for the unit turns and custodial cleaning. So I'm, I'm actually okay with the maintenance side. It's, it's really just the regional that needs we need to fill that. Is so Molly just out temporarily? Molly is out. Okay. So, mid December. Okay. So, um, you know, we are all people. Life happens. We keep we keep our heads up and keep moving forward. So we'll we'll make it work. We'll do the best we can. What's the point? I mean, we really had the regional fill technically until yesterday. So we have the regional and one maintenance vacant, and then. One accounting yeah. potential yeah. that we're hired for. Yeah. I mean, is there, would you post these positions? Do you get a lot of interest or are we struggling trying to find? Um, we had a lot of interest for the regional. Uh, we have like 100 applicants. Uh, uh, that second or third choice, or was it just? Well, we had technically, yes, oh. but we had already made the offer and they accepted, so you kind of move on yeah. from there. And you don't expect someone to oh, withdraw. Um, so we we have some some internal discussions to have about what we want to do, and then um, for maintenance we we had a not not a huge interest 
Um, but we've had quite a few applications. We've had some good, uh, some good candidates that were kind of trying to compare. It's, it's always a question of do you hire for the cultural fit, the skills, the combo? Do you want to hold out for that unicorn person who's got both? Um, so that's one of the hard parts. We did hire one who just kind of met, checked all the boxes, had a lot of construction experience, and a lot of um, handyman, just personal handyman experience. So that's the person who came up and started today. Um, pretty confident that it was great. And then just looking for another person. We, we had one interview with a gentleman who was super green, didn't know anything about vegans, but was like, had such a good spirit and character. But the team was like, you know, any other time if we were fully staffed, we'd say let's hire for the training. But not in this case. We're so um, shorthanded. We really need a person who can kind of just hit the ground running. So that's kind of what's for me a huge organizational challenge that we're having right now. Um, couple that with the holidays cuts in on our time to actually get work done. Um, but that's kind of I would say what's really weighing on me. For LHA. Mm -hmm. So, do you have a maintenance version of Suites? Technically, we do. <coughs> it's been our team of three has been amazing at communication, teamwork, organizing the workload, and really just being flexible to pitch in. Yeah, that's, um, that's a lot. Yeah. And now we have a team <coughs> as well. Mm -hmm. So. New, new build doesn't mean no work. <laughs> it's actually a different level of work where you have to decide is this an actual maintenance issue or is this a warranty issue? Yeah. And then you have to run up the warranty process. So um, we're, we're doing that on two fronts with Zinnia and Village on Main. So Village on Main doesn't have a dedicated maintenance person and New Suites is it doesn't have a dedicated maintenance person. And Bridal because they've lumped in with Village on Main. Hurdle, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be okay. Um, that's all I have for organizational stuff that I can think of is staffing challenges. Uh -huh. and, and you guys do the other organization plans? You already did the budget. Well, that, that'll be in my Later. financial opinion. Okay. <laughs> so we can move to development and project. Okay. So Ascent is under construction. We have a groundbreaking that is scheduled for <coughs> the first of the week. Oh, sorry. It is scheduled for the 21st. It'll be at the Hearthstone. Um, we kind of have it scheduled there just for weather permitting issues. So that's at 10.30 a.m. on the 21st. So just so you know, Laura, I'm not going to be that one. Okay. Do you know what they are going to be putting up? Just the a first day. And then for Village on May, um, so December 3rd at 2.30 p.m. What do you go That's Tuesday. That's also the day that Patrick comes back. <laughs> and then um, for Zinnia, we're having the grand opening on potentially 12 16, Monday the 16th of December at 11 a.m. It's kind of a hold that we have on the calendar, which is Catherine and the elements can run some of the state. So are we considering, and I think I asked this last time and I thought the answer was no, but I probably didn't hear it. Does any actually belong to the housing authority now? No. No, we don't own it. We don't own it outright. We are a sliver mm -hmm. partner, right. a special limited partnership, so it, it, it would not have happened without our participation in that respect. And then we are the property manager, so I think it would be completely appropriate if, if you wanted to come to the grand opening. Because if not for the partnership, it would happen. 
Technically, it's not in our portfolio. Yeah, yeah for, for, for all knows this. Um, that project actually started before the, the city took over the housing authority. So that was going all the way back to Fall River when they didn't have enough cash to close the deal on Fall River. So the city through the inclusion of the affordable housing fund purchase the property surrounding the suites for $750,000. So then we, as the city, started the conversation with Element because we weren't in the role of the housing authority. So that's still one of the hangovers from pre bringing it in. Which, for permanent supportive housing, honestly, that's probably not a bad model not to be in an ownership role in that, just because of the other things that come in and facilitate the development of it, but then have the management piece to draw money out of it. You know, because when, at the end of the day, I'm like on the suites when we're stuck with, oh, here's a $100,000 math expense. That's not on us. And so we'll, we'll see if we have another project, but not a bad model. Mm -hmm. Are they fully leased out? Mm -hmm. Yep. They leased faster than we were. Wow. Huge kudos to John and our staff mm -hmm. um, for getting all that application paperwork done. Single handedly, also while trying to manage the space. Yeah, that's a lot. How's it going, Michelle? Um, I mean, every 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 property has its bonus opening, um, and then when you add in the permanent supportive housing aspect, it can be difficult. But honestly, it hasn't been that bad as far as tenants go. Um, I have some updates for you. When it's my turn. Yeah, I mean, we we're we're going through the rough patches as of people moving in and adjusting to being housed and not understanding apartment and community living, understanding work having pools, and suddenly that can be difficult. And so we're doing our best to work with folks um, to help with that transition. At the end of the day, it's we make the recommendation as a property manager to the owner and they make the calls. So um, I do prefer this structure, as you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not necessarily always the decision maker for some of the harder calls. Um, I would say the biggest issue we had was the security. The security that the owner selected was not great, um, is not great. So um, we've been struggling with that. After we told them that, to be at least a couple dozen times. Mm -hmm. but, you know, sometimes have they changed it? Not right now. Right? I thought I thought they were going to. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no we're, I mean, we're, we're having conversations about, you know, what the options are. Um, ultimately, it's their decision. You know, we just make recommendations. Mm -hmm. so, um, Small recommendations, huh? It's just not the same company that this is. Yeah. That's the one we were recommending to yeah, use the one, because they're great. And the cohesiveness of two properties yeah. and one campus. And so we made our recommendations and our arguments, and they ultimately will make the decision on what they want to do. Um, so. More, more staffing issues. How, how is that for snow? We have a plan. Our snow removal plan last year was one where we had a, an on call person in addition to the regular on-call and from the feedback I got from the staff that would, could be very overwhelming for one person to then go around and do snow removal at 10 properties plus nine months ten. So this year we're, um, we've adjusted so that every maintenance person is responsible for their own property. Um, we make the call the day before whether or not you're on, on call for snow removal and it's mostly an expectation that you're gonna show up we did have a kind of trial run, a dry run, <laughs> pun intended, <laughs> this weekend. Um, we were ready to come in on Saturday and shovel up to five inches of heavy wet snow, but thankfully nothing happened. We didn't really get any, a little slush here and there, and that was it. Um, but 
even with just two people scheduled, um, the assistant community managers and property managers were kind of ready to, to pitch in where needed. And I was even planning to come to Fall River Spring Creek because C and John were both on vacation. So um, it worked out, but I think we'll we'll have a better result because then you have you know the combination of someone running around with the, the snow plow on the truck plowing the parking lots. You'll have the staff. We've got we bought a new snow a new snowblower. Think. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're buying a new snowblower. We've got the Coleman move to a different property. Um, we're supposed to be getting another like a four wheeler with a plow on it. That's what my snowblower is. But um, I, think, I, think, I think they bought a snowblower for village on the like yes. just your handheld. Oh well, yeah, most properties yeah. have snow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we have the snowblowers. We've got the shovels. Some places it's better to. Shovel depends on the snow as well, so we'll have everybody kind of everyone working for a shorter amount of time rather than one or two people working for 12 hours because that can be a lot. And then, um, we did set aside money in 2025 for smoothing the contract if necessary. But we'll have to see. And, um, so a few things hopefully within a couple of months, we'll have the second truck. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's also a the Kubota, for lack of a better word, is probably Toro. That'll hopefully be coming. Um, Something more maneuverable, shortly. Yeah. Um, and then we've also talked to Matt McKenzie in our operations division, who's willing to come in and bring some of our operational crews to to help plow if we have staffing issues. So I would I want to go through that set before we trigger. Um, a contractor mm -hmm. um, because you know those guys are out anyway just <clears throat> diverting them real quick to move their property in mm -hmm. they're really fast because they do a lot of that so. you pay them? Hmm? you pay them? no <clears throat> it's part of that general IGA mm -hmm. yeah and what was budgeted we pay them contract it was more like what the city has in place for temporary snow removal staff that you can bring in yeah. so more like a temporary position as opposed to a big contract for the snow yes and it may be if, it, if there's enough of that we may have to look at it and true up but if it's one storm that's the whole point of the iga with the city is to just take advantage of the economy and scale and not I mean, yeah. Have every single thing changing because, um, you know, obviously, what the LHA is compensating for Molly and I is not probably covering all of our time. And so, you know, we just kind of watch it to make sure it's reasonably balanced. <laughs> So on the snow removal, I'm assuming it would be one of the big trucks, one of the big state trucks. On the no, road. it would be a three-quarter ton. And they would just make one sweep through the... Oh, they would get it done if they need to do. But, yeah, they would clear the pathway and things like that. Kind of like we deal with our, do our parking lots. So they would take the same approach. And at some point, it may make more sense for us to, as we start looking through this to get some of those drivers, they may, you know, we need to just see how it goes, but it may make sense that if they need to hire snowplow drivers, but they don't have quite enough work, that maybe we can figure it out that way as well. So we have the billing and the village on Main wrapping up the project construction pose we're still doing there's still some loose ends we're tying up things purchasing for the property um, that weren't covered under you know the construction contract um, probably doing a lot of cleaning and organizing before the grand opening and then um, we have the camera system up and running there um, but we're not able to access yet so snafu we're just waiting for the licensing through ATS to come through yeah. so I I need them they're they're working on on site that we can't 
access we can't access them so, so good good uh, learning for the next one that comes online as we we should have the, all the licenses but um, yeah so making sure that we're ready to go for the next set um, Village, so with the village wrapped up, that's we're also in the um, stabilization phase. This is really crucial time for like new construction where you're trying to keep costs down and see that stabilized financial three months before you convert to your current loan. You pay off your high, high interest construction loan in this case because it's pretty much leased up. Stabilization isn't as much of a scary um, <laughs> time for a rehab project, but still. Um, making sure that we hit those targets so that we can convert to our current loan, um, which just means better operations for us, less money um, being spent on interest. So that's kind of top of mind for that project. Zinnia, since we don't own it, I'm not too worried about that phase, except for us managing on the property <coughs> budget um, so that the owner can hit those targets for um, ascent. Over the construction's underway, we did have a an issue last week where they ran into a water line abandonment. That they had to run into the all night long doing construction, and we didn't get notice, and so that kind of created some issues. Um, so we've we've since addressed that with both the owner, our our co GP, uh, Penrose, the contractor in the city, um, and let the contractor know if that happens again. We need to be in contact with our property manager so that she knows what's happening. We can let people know because she was being woken up all hours of the night herself and the residents were knocking on her door to ask why is there construction happening next door to them. So um, fun fun stuff that we get to deal with. But that prop that project's underway. Um, we have you know we can use the owner architect and contractor lovingly known as OAC meetings if you don't know. Um, so those will be going on for a long time. But um, it's going through well. We've had a lot of work done at, in a rush um, to spend some CD money um, at the properties, some asphalt work, asphalt work at 1228 Main, at Briarwood, Fall River, Spring Creek, and Suites to restrain the asphalt and come into compliance with our HCD. HCD. BC voluntary compliance BCA um, with HUD. So we spent that money in a timely, timely way, got that done. We also had some concrete work done at the suites. If you've driven to the suites prior to a couple weeks ago, you might have noticed the big um, hole missing in concrete at the entranceway. So we got that repaired. So that's been fixed. We fixed one of the sidewalk ramps that didn't meet the ADA slope requirements and um, fixed a couple other spots just to improve ADA accessibility to the property. Um, so I just want to kind of throw this out about suites. And it, it's kind of, a, it's, it's a, just a strange thing. <coughs> Nelson Road that goes from Hover to Sunset, um, your little gal in the, in the wheelchair, there's no sidewalk there on the large majority of that. In fact, I think probably on most of that. And she's out on the road, granted, in the bicycle part of it, which scares me to death um, that she's going to get hit. Did, is there, I thought there was a way she could get from the property over to Village of Peaks without possibly going down Sunset. Not Sunset, but... Yes, I think that's the, the that's trail. That's the trail that's project that they have that they're going to build, but it's not. It's not, it's not currently built. Uh, but yeah, that's the plan is for that trail to be built so they can do that. I feel like she might have been used to be able to get through where the connection was to the church, but because of Zinnia now, that connection is severed. And so there is a way to get to the backside of. Um, the village, but it's all it's, village of peaks or something. Yeah, it's like gravel and grass, and it's like an emergency access if needed, but it's not paved so that people can um, drive there. Yeah, but I don't think that there is a paved way. Trying to look. I just saw her out there on the road, and I thought this is so a little scary. Yeah. Well, there is. Uh, 
their sidewalk actually, if you come out and you go by the Subaru dealership and then you turn down Industrial Circle. Yeah, you can get, she can get she, through there. She can get through there without getting on the road to get to that location. And she was actually just Nelson. No, yeah, Nelson. Yeah. So if you're trying to get to Village, you can do that, but you could also do that and then you go around the backside uh, and then from there, you could actually cross under over on the trail on the west side of Village of the Peaks. So there's a way to get there. She's going to be the shortest, fastest. So what I'm thinking, she's pretty tough. She's going to go the way she wants regardless. So yeah, but it just yeah. was a little scary to me. I did put an email out to Dakota. Um, I don't know if we ever discussed this, but there were issues with the irrigation lines during construction that resulted in some of the grass going to see the sun. I've not heard broken over a bunch of sod dying personally that we would then water because we're going to be doing the trail project. I'd like to zero scoop it anyway. So I've asked them in instead of resodding that for us in the spring because it was their fault, would they mulch the sweets and move the rocks and help us make the sweets look a little bit more presentable? Um, so we can hear about them on that. I think that that would just, it makes more sense and it's probably cheaper for them in the end. They, they've had to fix a lot of things that didn't have to work. So, um, yeah. hoping to make the sweets look so Aspen Meadows, or is how it's going with the flood? Um, Aspen Meadows neighborhood, we have the B2 vacancy, which was the meth rebuild. That's, uh, there's a contractor working in that unit. Um, I'd say they're probably 75 to 80% done. We then have to go and do a few more things that weren't, that wasn't covered in their scope. Um, and then we have another pretty um, heavy, unit turn on C5, which was the, was the eviction for the person who graduated from the HCU program. Um, and they lived there a long time, so it needs a lot of work. It's not that they trashed the place. They just, they were there for like 13 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Several kids grew up in the house, and um, so it just, it needs a lot of work. So those are two um, at Aspen Meadows neighborhood. As far as asking those senior with the flooring, we finally got the proposal from the flooring company, the contractor, and the architect. We're reviewing that and um, we're scheduling an attorney to review all of our options, make sure we're, um, we have, you know, what all of our choices are before we move forward. Um, but that proposal initially involved uh, an in kind donation of staff time to move. Um, residents belonging to one side of the apartment to the other. We have since said that's just not feasible. We don't have the capacity to do that. So um, we'll have to figure if, if we go with that proposal, we'll have to figure out if there's a cost to hire a new company and what that looks like. So hopefully almost there. We don't really have any units that I can think of where it's causing a problem. Um, so much that we have to do something right away. Mm -hmm. We do have one vacant unit that needs to be filled that we've kind of been in line about. Do we wait to replace the floor? Do we do it now? But just in the interest of getting the unit right away, we're going to call it just replacing it. Um, that was a, it wasn't due to the flooring issues, it was due to the tenant. So, um, working on that. I actually went through in our maintenance meeting this morning our list of vacancies and unit terms that we need to tackle. And I feel pretty confident. Um, there's quite a few that we listed as a one priority. It's, it's quick and easy. We can get it done this week or early next week. Um, sort of help us prioritize for when we do hire the unit term that we need to give them a list to get to work. So what needs to be done. That's it on development and project updates. That's it. I do have something for number six. 
I wanted to get your um, feedback and uh, opinions on moving from a monthly copy conversations to either a every other month um, or a quarterly schedule, with the exception of the suites and things that they do benefit from a monthly check-in. Um, we just are right, we run out of sometimes we run out of topics. Sometimes it feels like it's just the same handful of tenants coming and voicing the same concerns. Um, a month is sometimes not enough for our staff to make a dent in some of the requests or things that come up. And it can feel a little bit like a defeat every time you go and say, well, we don't have an answer for that yet. And it's like months, because it takes a few months to get some things done. Um, and our staff would just appreciate you know, less, less of their time. Yeah. So I remember when we first started this, and it really was because the city had just taken over and there was a lot of information that needed to be talked about month after month after month. I've attended enough of those meetings in your ride. It's the same people, the same, the same problems. And the attendance has really gone down. Well. I mean, I personally think once a quarter would do it, but if they would, they would be more comfortable with every other month, but I don't know that that's, you know, if they're going to forget, is it this month, is it next month, if it was once a quarter? Yes. Yeah, it seems like to me it would be a little bit more, but that's my opinion. I think the manager do really good job of posting the mm -hmm. meetings around the building, you know, whether it's in the elevator or on their main, main board. Um, that's quarterly. I think it's, it's not much of a lift to, to put notice out a week or two before to remind people, plus having it on the TV that's scrolling. Mm -hmm. um, we can post, we can also post the dates on our website, which we don't utilize that right now for that purpose. Um, and then have a deadline if they have questions that they can submit. When are you thinking, if you decide to make this change, when are you thinking to start? January. Okay, so it would be a lot of getting the information out ahead of time so that they are not a lot of complaints. Oh, we'll get complaints. Oh, yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. Some people will like it, some people won't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Some, some properties, people are way more active and engaged and then at others, unless there's something large to talk about. And it's, 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 it's costly too. You know? I mean, yeah. when we're buying all this food every month, it adds up and that cuts into other funds that could otherwise be used for residents. Yeah, and I think you have the one in the first quarter in January, which kind of is on schedule. Yeah. And that's where you tell everybody, look, these, <laughs> these have changed a lot. So we're gonna move to a quarterly basis. Um, I think to your point, they're, they're not lasting a long time. Um, I do think like the suites is one where that's different. And, but here's the big, the big change that I've seen is that the ma property managers we have in place now, they have really good relationships with their tenants. Mm -hmm. And so that's actually, I think the reason why these orders well attended and the problems aren't there um, and I mean Arlene you were there when we first started mm -hmm. it was chaotic yeah. to say the least in terms of but it was it was all of these things that we were catching up on and the lack of engagement with the previous housing authority and I think now there's so much engagement that's occurring between the property managers and you know they can contact Laura and they can contact Sarah and they can contact me and they do but I just think that it's really decreased the need for it now we'll obviously have the ability to have special ones if something happens that requires us to to come in and engage uh, with the residents and we do that now anyway if something were to happen we would you know schedule those meetings and move in pretty quick Okay. How do we, how would we uh, get out certain projects? Like, you know, Sarah, they're always interested in this bond. Rather than wait a quarter, 
order? Is there some mechanism that so just give them some information? We have a newsletter that goes to our tenants if they sign up for it. And we are we have switched that to every other month because there was a lull in um, capacity and content when I started. And I think if we're lowering the frequency of coffee conversations, we're going to increase the content for a monthly newsletter. And the newsletter is done by um, Scott Yoho with the communications team. And so having you know, what I kind of envision is having more of a cohesion with the maintenance supervisor of the regional and him. To, to give feed him the content for what needs to be getting out to residents and then really encourage residents to sign up for those newsletters. And then the property manager can also get the newsletter, post the newsletter um, at the property um, for people to, to get the info. Yeah. It would be helpful, I don't think that there is now a link to the newsletters on the LNJ site. That might be helpful. I mean, honestly, I've been trying to track down coffee and conversations and Eric has been super helpful, but um, yeah, just some issues by email. So I spent a long time kind of going through the site, and I think that'd be really helpful. The yeah. site needs a lot to do that. I'm wondering if we need to uh, include Village on Main on a monthly basis, at least for a year, because of their new model, or do you think that a reporter is is out? That would be our most active community right now. And I can tell you from personal experience, it is a lot to manage the deluge of questions and emails yeah. on a monthly basis. When the majority of it will be answerable by a regional and a community manager, absent a recap project. So I think the project's over, now is the time to set and manage expectations going forward because if we continue this another year it becomes the standard for the and it is exhausting. I've got three emails this week asking questions and then you answer questions and then we get some questions. So I would like to kind of step back and reassess what does this open communication really look like because it's not realistic. It, it's not realistic and it's not manageable like this going forward. Um, it's, it is a lot. And now that the rehab project is over, we can ease our way back into it. And it kind of settled down over there too. Yeah, I think. Oh, yeah. From what I hear, anyway. This month we're going to be talking about budget and rent increases, so um, I think that it'll be a, a, a more attendance. Um, we did send out rent increase letters to all properties, um, just notifying people of the 2025 potential increases. Um, so I do expect more people to come to this month's coffee conversations. And Harold, you're going to be at those or no? Or just Warren? Some of them. Yeah. Well, I think Bill and Zane typically try to have me at that one. Um, you know, Hartford and Lodge, probably not because they don't pay it. Right. And so we tend to go where that's there. Um, you know, part of the challenge is, you know, I think you've been a few of these on budget where I've had to get pretty direct and you want all of these things. But you're upset because we're raising the rent. We can't do this without doing this. And um, and so, I you know last year I was pretty pointed at times, depending on the group and their questions. And so probably it is we need to make sure to get at some of these. Well, I'm fine if you guys want to go to quarter. Start in January. I agree. It's reasonable. Yeah, yeah. They can come here. Um, 
They can even, I don't know if people do, did ever submit questions ahead of time if they don't have physically come? Okay. No, I mean, I think we haven't talked, I, and it's interesting. Here's the thing that, that has been interesting to me. Those that have had like, because there's a question of operational versus policy, right? I mean, most of their questions, in some ways, they're delving in the operational world. And there's a lot of them that know, oh, I'll start with the manager. If there's not anything that's happening, then they go to Laura and, and rarely uh, do they ever come to me. And there's a couple of people that will just blast all of us. But it's like, oh, the Wi Fi's not, or the washing machines aren't working, or oh, the Wi Fi's not working. And those are okay. Um, that's just their personality. Um, since Lauren's been on board, I've had very few of those that have escalated all the way to me. Um, and, and so I say all of that because it's interesting what's driving the questions. And, and sometimes I think if this is the broader challenge, that we're facing today <coughs> in this <coughs> just generally in the city and everything that we're doing is that if it's not what I want then it turns into this thing but we're not looking at what you want we're looking at what everybody needs and and that's just something that's become more pervasive just in everything that we do it becomes what I want it's not taking this broader community view or a residential view and it's, um, and so sometimes you have to navigate that and I think that's part of why we want to go to court with you. Yeah. Well, you see that you see the council. <clears throat> I, I mean yeah. I see it every day. I'm sure um, I only see it instead of council. Yeah I mean but you see it at council you see it in this we see it every day it's like I want you to do this yeah. and it's well you know we're kind of looking at a broader community and looking at broader issues and it turns into a thing. And uh, it's interesting, we're even seeing it pop in HOAs now, too. <laughs> um, where it's, it's, it's just turned into a thing. Anything else, for Okay. All right. Resident quality of life. I'm not sure what goes underneath there. What's Nothing we have, you have nothing that we have. You know, we had the, <clears throat> we had that on the agenda when we were starting things like the bus work and Gene really spoke to a lot um, too. And we thought we had it when we were um, trying to get money to do things. So. <clears throat> um, we had it when we were, you know, trying to get resident fees and things like that, and that sort of just become its its own thing and um, what they're doing in the properties but I think that circles back then to the managers that we have in place and that we're not necessarily seeing the same amount of requests we're having for I mean if for those that have been on the board it's like you know the patio furniture asked and AMSA and can't move it too heavy those things we're, we're not hearing of even coming to us before the board we're not hearing a lot of that because I think of the engagement with the managers as they're moving through and talking to them through, through these projects. And, you know, that was lesson learned from AMSA because we, we inherited that one. Mm -hmm. And they just said, here's what we're going to buy. Mm -hmm. And we all just went into it and said, we got to get it done. Well, <clears throat> for those that were here, if you remember, there was no discussion with them about artwork right. or these other issues. And so I think the managers have really just folded that into their daily operations and so we're not seeing it as much um well your managers seem to be some of the comparatively more personal yep. and, and that makes a lot of difference so. and i think they're interested in it too i mean we actually if we hear anything we hear from them mm -hmm. we wish we'd have more money for these types of things and we're sitting there going, well, here's what you have. And properties like Carstone and Lodge, they're the ones that suffer the most because of that 202 program and the fact that their budget's really dictated by HUD. 
And so we're really seeing on the other properties, they're pretty good about working through it. Uh, Spring Creek, we've had some issues on resident activities because of internal battles. That was it Spring Creek. <laughs> <coughs> because of internal battles. This group wants to do this. Uh -huh. Yeah, this group wants to do this, and this group wants to do something for everyone. Again, it's all about, well, this mm -hmm. is what I want to do, and we instituted the vote. And, yeah, we don't have that anymore. But, it's not. so. But managers that are going to do a good job now, how are they getting up to date information on things like Sarah's? Like they talk daily. They, they talk. talk. Yeah, yeah I, I call them often and try to go meet with them in person at least once a month or every other month if I can. So. Or like when something happens and Sarah's seeing the report, she's communicating yeah. either the day of or the next day with the manager on the property where something happens. And then depending on what the nature of it is, she's communicating with Lauren, myself, Molly, yeah. Leo, I mean, it just the, the nature of what she's seeing, but the communication is pretty tight. Okay, we'll get doing that on there. Um, LHA report, update on operations, occupancy report. So it looks scarier than it is. Okay, because I did have, I did have some questions. Um, we went over our vacants this morning, and you know, like the, it shows a lot at um, Fall River Spring Creek, but you know, the only two at each are ones that need like actual maintenance work. The rest are either they got notice and they moved out and it's a light clean flip the unit and rent it, um, or it's light touch up and rent. Um, so that's not as, as bad as it looks. So it's nothing really critical over there. No. Those are decent places, yeah. So where the lag has been at Fall River Spring Creek, we did a training with Yardy last month. <coughs> No, it's September. September. It's end of September because it's November now. <laughs> it goes um, and one of the, the one of the sessions that we did in that training was moving the waitlist from the paper waitlist to PRD. We had initially I said we I wasn't here, but LAG had started to do that project a long time ago. The person who kind of had all the knowledge about doing that left, so we just stick, stuck with the paper and an Excel spreadsheet. Um, not the best way to do it, so we um, have moved that responsibility back down to the property managers to manage their own wait lists, and they are working on getting it into yard. It's not um, super intuitive, but so far, Fall River Spring Creek are the first ones that got it done. Um, and that's really a testament to Nikki, our assistant, and John working so quickly and working together. Um, and so the lag in their vacancies is because they couldn't until they got the wait list in DRD, they couldn't start calling people. They didn't want to start calling people with the old process. So they should be filling up these units rapidly. So then DRD will update this regularly? Yes, the so list. they'll apply, they will put it, in, they put it into DRD for now ourselves, it's data entry. Mm -hmm. um, and then we pull from that list and all their information that we put into it then just transfers over. So you're, you're gonna do data entry, either putting it in the wait list or putting it in when they apply. Either way, we're just doing it one time. Um, when we get Rent Cafe live, we can have people applying for the waitlist online, which then removes the data entry piece altogether. Rent Cafe is a is a module within Yardi where they can apply online, they can do work orders online, they can pay online for rent. Um, the last Yes. 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 So you have Rent Cafe, that's the PHA side, which is the voucher side, which is a whole beast and animal itself. And then the affordable housing side is its own. And it'll eventually, so I had took on the responsibility of updating on websites. I stopped that because technically 
Red Cafe will become our websites. Mm -hmm. So they actually build the websites out and they'll have, like, if you're an applicant or if you want to get to the portal, to make payments and everything like that. So we try to keep the websites different based on the type of properties. So the same website for our light tech properties, the same website for our um, 202 properties, and then another type of website for our um, support housing properties. So right now I've sent all the information off to them. We just have to <clears throat> get all the pictures, find out where the pictures are on our drive, so that I can send those in a separate email. But it sounds like the affordable housing side is not as big of a piece to get set up as the voucher side is. And the already does the setup both. Yeah, we go through a whole implementation package and we've already paid for the, the implementation piece. Mm -hmm. So it's setting up, we have weekly meetings on the voucher side um, and it's going through. On the voucher side, you have to go through four or five different module setups. Um, on the affordable, it doesn't sound like it's like that. It's getting the website set up and then having those links. So whenever we, so anybody could actually go to the, link, the, the website, apply, and get the links. So, um, whereas the HTTP side, it's you release when people can get on the wait list, so it's a, it's a lot different. But yeah, we're, we're moving. <laughs> it probably won't get, I'm going to say, completed until the first quarter of 2025, as, as much as told, they told us it would take to get through each module set up, and we do testing, and they train us as we go, so. <laughs> For the rest of the properties, we have our four down units, it's kind of in the same, same way it's ongoing. Um, the Sweet Smack unit, which we did get our final testing completed, and the, um, that's not, the decon, um, where they ripped out everything that was contaminated. <laughs> Aspen Meadows B2 is the one that we have the contract we're working on. That was a complete mess gut and rebuild. Aspen C5, that was the full unit being for the eviction. And then the 111 unit needed to conform due to odor. The odor's actually not that bad anymore, but if you go in certain corners within the unit, you can still smell the urine. So we, we can't have someone like that. So that's the one we're, we're just going to go ahead and do. So. Um, it's, it's, you know, just one of those things. So on the neighborhood <clears throat> where you've got two down, I understand that you've got three rentable. Is there, I mean, because those are decent places up there, is it the train? Or is it just that people are not interested in it? No, so two of the units um, are ready to rent. Um, it's it's the wait list piece. That's what's the lag. Um, Summer's working on how to transition the wait list. Oh, I forgot to tell you, we also recently hired another um, assistant community manager. We hired her months ago, but she had to wait to start due to an injury. Um, so she started two weeks ago, and she is splitting time between Village on Green and Aspen Meadows. And so now um, both Kat and Summer have that additional help to, to get the wait list uh, into Yardy. Um, but yeah, that those three units, that's mostly just due to the lag and calling people on the wait list. They should run very quickly. And then we still run the same thing on suites when you've got internet MHP that's got the most. Yep, and they have people lined up and ready to go that we're ready to work on. It's due to the um, lack of maintenance staff there that we weren't prioritizing those um, because we were just making do with three people mm -hmm. in an hour. It was four, now we're down to three. One's on vacation this week. So currently we have two folks working on maintenance team. One starting today, so we have a plan for those units um, with the uh, unit term company that we're going to contract with. And so, um, one thing with the, the Fall River, we released the manager's unit since nobody's um, occupying that one. But similar to what we saw at AMSA, a two bedroom, 50% AMI is really hard rent. So we might need to make um, a decision on moving the rent. Um, we'll market it 
for a short time, but if we're not seeing movement, I'd like to get that unit rented, and even if we have to just do a lower amount to get money in the door. Is it, we had a two bedroom, 50% of the MSA that was vacant for nine months. So you have that option to lower it and then to move it back up if the other name came up again? There's sort of a guidepost on the AMI rent levels that we can kind of drop it to 45% AMI see if that gets someone because there's a lot of times where people are just at the two times the rent amount mm -hmm. just don't make it and if we can lower it a couple hundred dollars it becomes something that they can do because we do not want to rent burden an applicant even though they might be telling you I can pay it we're like yeah but what are you not paying just so you can pay your rent that's not the goal um, so if we can lower the, the rent amount a bit we get someone in who still can afford it, that's what we want to do. Usually that's fine, we don't need to jump through any special hoops. Um, as long as we document that we marketed it, didn't have any success, and that's why we chose to do it. We just need to make sure we keep that documentation um, in case the investor asks for it. Um, <coughs> We only have two units that remain vacant at Village on Main. Um, the rest all have pending applications or move-in dates now through December. Um, so we're almost fully leased there again. I'm including the vacancy loss, which makes me sad. Yeah. So this, this is the lost rent because units sat vacant for so long. This is the money we didn't take in. So 632,000. Yeah. And so you've included Zinnia on here. That's what I was I, I can't take that. it out now because it's part of the all prop, so just ignore that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just deduct it. But yeah, technically, it's part of our portfolio and you already so it lumps it in. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to create another one? And that's just because it's not fully like set up yet. Don't actually have any vacancies there. So yeah. 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 That's the cost of not prioritizing unit terms and not having to yeah, do <coughs> So eventually we're going to get those turned around in. We're going to see this number a lot lower in 2025. That's my goal. And how do we get to how do we do it? Should we close? 97% vacancy? We did. We. <laughs> We put it high, so 97% is what. So 3% vacancy is what's budgeted for 2025. It was 4%, but we have like four properties that are way over their budget as far as vacancies in the third quarter. So we're going to try to get unit turns down to five days, five to seven business days, instead of 30 to 60. What would that be dollar wise? It depends on the unit. Yeah, it's been just mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> uh, We talk about 100,000, 300,000. Yeah, yeah. For a month or five days. Well, this is basically 10 months. I'll say that. So I'm just curious if you really would think. Uh, um, I've it, it's okay. It's it, 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 the question's only for mine. <laughs> It's so, it's so different at each that. property because um, because most of the properties the way we do it is the way the vacancy is counted is based on the content rent. So even though the suites they have tenant based vouchers or project based vouchers, we don't do the vacancy on those high dollar amounts. So that's why it's like it's really hard to lock down that number. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to reference myself. Um, so if you're saying in 10 months it's 600000 Per unit it's about 1200 I mean that should probably come down to 200. 250 Yeah. It's kind of what my brain where the math is coming, but yeah. But that's also why we're putting in almost 180. 
80,000 for ARPA interest into paying for the unit terms. And yeah. I'm sorry. So the unit turns additional help to do some of the larger, yeah, additional help. It's one time funding, potentially add more to it as our interest funds become available. That's mm -hmm. called swooping. You know, kind of like push that money into this nice little pot. Um, and so it's it's not a dedicated source of funding, but it will help us get through this, this sort of difficult time period and then what I'd like to know long term is, is there a cost benefit to having a custodial team that we call for unit terms? Because the way that it's been explained to me by our staff is really they should be coming in and cleaning the unit first because you can see a lot more of what needs to be done once it's been cleaned. The maintenance comes in and does their work. They clean up after themselves. The way it is now, they go in and do a bunch of work and then they have to do a full unit clean. One, they're not cleaners. They're not thinking like a cleaning company would. And to their own admission, they don't do a great job. And we're paying them X dollars a month, or X dollars an hour to clean when we would be paying a lot less for a cleaning company or a custodial staff person. So I'm hoping through this contract we get to see that, uh, that data and then we can make decisions whether we continue um, contracting out for that or does that become an internal position? I don't know if I've never noticed it before, but I just never noticed that information before. This is yeah. just, this <coughs> is the second time I've put it on here. Yeah. Thank you. And, really and I figured out how to do it myself this month. So I'm to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, we might want to change your dates. So. Okay. <laughs> just because October hasn't been fully uh, so processed it might be more. yet. So there's more data than that. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, well, and part of it is, so what you do is when you restabilize and you catch them up, then you tighten up on the timelines based on what we're doing. So it's really kind of two things happening. We're bringing money in and we're going to give you help and we're going to catch you up, but we're going to tighten the requirements on um, in terms of what you have to get done because part of what we've said is it's been really hard for us to figure out what's really driving the issue because it's easy to say well we have this we have this or we we're taking something off your plate now we're going to be able to really zone in on what the issue is and so it will we will tighten yeah. and and change expectations yeah, no this is great it's just painful So just out of curiosity, is there any of these um, places that is really hard to rent because people don't really want to live there? Okay. I would say the more difficult piece is getting folks to afford the light temper. It's still not, I mean, at, Certainly, mine are just still not affordable for non-fixed income. Mm -hmm. 60%, yeah, but 60%. 60, yeah, that's 60 and 50 are hard. 30 yeah. and 40, they go fast. Uh, but when you're when you're talking Social Security and limited retirement mm -hmm. funds, um, it's hard for people to, to pay that. Okay. But I don't, I wouldn't say any of them it's an issue of location or reputation, anything in the Navy suites. Well, you can always walk down to else and get it. Okay. Property <clears throat> updates. I think you do you have any more to add to that or um No, I feel like we kind of talk more general about them and all the other things. We have had a couple deaths at a few properties. Um, we had an accident outside of Village on Main a couple weeks ago. Um, that, that resident is back home. We scrambled to make sure that they, to see if they had medical coverage, and they do. She, she doesn't. Right so, um, I just, you know, it's a rough time of year. The holidays are coming, so. 
trying to make sure that our holiday parties are getting scheduled. Um, John has been working to get his um, holidays for both properties, purchasing food, coming up with a plan for a pop-up, the village on Main residents are wanting to schedule um, their holiday parties, um, and just keeping up the communication and, and trying to get those things scheduled. <coughs> So village on Main, the kitchen was used well. They can use that kitchen. It's nice. Yeah. That's really beautiful. I haven't done a full tour yet. So I'm always there to deal with an issue, so I never get to just mosey on around and look. Okay. All right. One thing on the operational report that we're trying to um, not directly connected to LHA, but it's connected. So um, we're evaluating, um, for lack of a better word, looking at how we handle our part system look for our fleet maintenance department. Uh, what's interesting is we're finding that some of the, some groups that do this actually procure at a wider range. And so it may be something that once we get a little further on the fleet side, it may actually slide over and that there becomes some a, a warehousing function on the LHJ side that's more virtual in terms of you know real time inventory that doesn't require us to go as often to Home Depot and Lowe's and some of these other locations. And if there's an economy of scale, they get it at a lower cost. So. Um, that's something that I'm working on on the fleet side, but we'll evaluate that. Things like disposables, we definitely know are significantly uh, cheaper. So like gloves, and things, you know, just the stuff that they use may make more sense for us to go there just because it's um, well, like, on the disposables like 30% cheaper. Looking at Erica. Yeah. I was gonna say. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. <laughs> so there's a there's an economy of scale coming in. So there'll be more on that once we get our hands wrapped around it. And and I think that, that would that would be great because we, we do a lot of ad hoc purchases and there wasn't a good culture of doing um, the biannual property inspections and planning out. Um, so our staff are just now getting back into that habit of, okay, we know all the ceiling fans at Aspen Meadows neighborhood need to be replaced because they're all starting to fail. Mm -hmm. So instead of piecemeal ordering ceiling fan by ceiling fan as they do, order them all. And then as you either turn a unit or have capacity, go in and replace the ceiling fan. But you get them for a better price. And then if there's larger things like we were seeing at Aspen Meadows neighborhood, washers and dryers, all the originals, they're all dying. It's cheaper to replace them and fix them. And some of them you can't fix because the parts aren't available anymore. So doing that assessment at the time that you do your inspections and then planning and budgeting for it, whether you're doing it through replacement reserves this year, um, the budget that you have, or saying, okay, next year we need to budget additional funds because we know this is gonna happen. That traditionally has not been happening. And so we end up creating more work for our staff, more work for Kendra and her staff. It makes her want to pull her hair out. And we spend more money. So we need to be operating more like a business and less like a small time. Have to do it. And what this will do is actually then, if they need it, is you pick up the phone and you call the group you know, fleet and say, oh, I need this. They'll then go out and source it for you. And they have a, 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 a different economy scale. Instead of thinking, oh, well, we're buying 100 ceiling fans, they may be in something that buy 1,000. And so, but you're not chasing it down. So then there's a cost avoidance of having staff spend their time chasing down the procurement of these issues versus just calling essentially a warehouse person and saying, can you find me any four burner stove, you know, electric, whatever it is, or, you know, in 
for smart bears and start trying to find four burner stoves that are con convection convection versus the traditional electric stoves because that reduces your likelihood of fire. And so give me some options. I'll spit it back. Some of the software they're using we know actually works with the fleet software and I asked them, well, does it work with this? And they're like, well, let me see. So basically it's a large scale inventory model. So you just see. Yeah. It's just your channel. No, they that's parts warehouse, but they only have a warehouse too. Which we don't have. Which they don't have, but we gotta figure out how to use everything in there. Because it just you know, I hear we need storage, we need these things. We really don't because you know warehousing's changed in the time I've been in this business. <coughs> Warehouses have been getting smaller and smaller because you don't want to invest money in things that you don't absolutely need because what you end up finding is they end up staying there for 10 years because you didn't need it. So you're looking at that real-time inventory model that says, how do we create these partnerships to just say, I need this, it comes in. So it really is more of a private sector strategy. Um, right now that Lauren's here making some of these other changes, really easier for us to evaluate that. And standardizing what we put in our units. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing that I'd like to see going forward. It's hard to do with the model that LHA has traditionally taken in partnership. Because we are not the decision maker. We are not picking the appliances and materials and things like that. You know, architects like to design beautiful buildings. Yeah. We care about how it functions and how it lasts we have to manage it. So eight different lights with eight different light bulbs might look good, but from an operation standpoint, I'd rather have eight different receptacles with the same lights in all of them. You know, something standard, easy, but everyone's obsessed with these like LED hockey puck lights that they put in that they say they're gonna last 20 years, but they're not. <laughs> and so like having that information and tying that into our new builds, it's going to be really critical long term. I mean, I'm thinking 40, 50 years down the road, not just five years down the road, because we're going to double our inventory in the next four years. So, yeah. Okay. Ken, you are online. I'm answer. <laughs> so, there's there's nothing too alarming about financials. I mean, most of it is vacancies. Agency dollars are over budget in the lower part properties. Um, with that, we do have some carry over insurance claims um, and insurance expenses. We didn't have any claims this year. Most of that is carried forward from the prior year. We voted and received the funds. Um, we're just incurring the expenses right now. And then the other thing that we never really budgeted for in the past, we did in 2025, was our bad debt. Um, because we're more proactive with sending um, people to collections now. Um, that's where I see kind of an anomaly on the general expenses um, where we're over budget, and that's just basically because we didn't budget a dollar amount for our bad debt expenses. So now in 2025, what we've done is expected some revenue costs to be reported, and those same revenue costs and for damages will be also bad debt. It's more than likely most of those move collections. Um, so that will be a little different for next year. Um, does anybody have any questions regarding particular properties? Or? I just have one, yeah. and I think it has already been answered, but I think I knew the answer anyway. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Under the LHA uh, Briarwood, where you've got that uh, maintenance expense, is that the um, grant? Those actually, uh, the maintenance, those are, uh, that's, I think that's what it is. Unit 101 and 102 for half units? Yeah, so it's 331.4%. Yeah, so that is insurance repairs. So those those were actually under an insurance repair. We got the money last year, but the work to complete those and happened this year. It was about um, $40,000. To, to get those two units that they demolished. So that's right. Yeah. Okay. 
you won't see the, the RAM. The RAM is on LHA's budget. So LHA got the grant and LHA is doing it as a contribution expense. So these won't be capitalized assets of the properties. It's just we're contributing because a lot of the times that you put, you have to get investor approval. Like if you bring a bunch of grant money in, you have to get investor approval because it becomes part of their equity. Um, and if they don't approve it, um, then you have a problem. So our auditors said you can do it at the LHA and then you know, so that it actually doesn't go down properly. So you won't see that on Briarwood by itself, those expenses. Those expenses are actually coming through on LHA's books. Kendra, you went to each sheet earlier on. You just asked for general. Yeah, I was just asking for general. I wasn't even going to go through. I never go through a bunch of worksheets. On page, but on page two, I can't. You can stay in the third quarter. Yeah. It just kind of caught my eye that's a pretty sizable difference between the budget and Well, because, so here's the thing. We budget based on our development fees and when we're going to get development fees. Um, so it's based on this idea that we're going to get those developer fees in and that's not happening in the actual documents that are generated when the property closes. Uh, because developer fees come at particular capital contribution sections, and so until we can meet those capital contributions, that's when we receive developer fees. So right now, there's a timing time issue. Thing. It's a timing issue. So the way the way it's budgeted is, is it's budgeted kind of annually. Like, hey, we're going to get this. We should be getting it on a monthly basis, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, and it's all dependent on when the investors release the capital contributions um, and we can pay the developer fees. So there may be situations here by the end of the year with Village on Main um, and even Ascent that we show capital contributions coming in and developer fees being paid that may actually carry forward to um, the next, unless we can recognize them, which would be a journal entry at the end of the year basically recognizing the revenue, not necessarily received, but recognizing it because we earned it, they just haven't distributed it to us yet. So I have one more question. Yeah. Okay. Last page. It says page one of one. Oh, yeah, I just noticed that. Mm -hmm. I, we're missing some properties on that one. My my question is again complicated. There's a column called suspense. Yes. What is that? So that is um, based on the subsidies. So what happens is, if there's an amount in there, what that usually means is we owe money back to the subsidy agency. Uh -huh. So let's say, and, and it's a lot of it's timing. So from month to month, it'll change. So if somebody moves out at the very end of October and the subsidy agency pays us for November, but we don't have a rent charge because they're already moved out, mm -hmm. that charge gets moved into suspense. And, it's, and you're waiting for that subsidy agency to come back in December and pull that money back. And that's usually what happens is they pull it back. Or if they don't, if they don't have enough to pull it back, because I mean, we have that situation as well. If you can't, if you don't have other tenants there and you can't pull the money back, then it's on us to make sure we get it paid back to those subsidy agencies. So your, que your yeah. question on the development fee is why we, Kendra created the uh, fund balance worksheet. And, and that's why I spend as much time looking at that as I do kind of the budget pieces because there's a, you can't control the timing of the development fees because the project timeline controls that in completion dates. And so I watched that fund balance sheet to understand, okay, we're projected to be at $3.3 million fund balance, but we're at 3.1, but it's gonna come in in January of 25, which then, at the end of the day, you're whole. So you're watching your fund balance sheet because that's where it'll go awry if the development fees come in much farther out in time than you're projected. And so 
that that's the sheet that really I think in my mind reconciles the development fees coming in is yeah. the sheet. Um, well, it's a sheet that's in. It's an operational said, sheet. Yeah, so you see it in budget. Yeah, now you see it in budget, but it's something that we do in with it. And we take the original closing documents that basically outline when we're supposed to receive those development fees, and then I have another one that says when did we receive them. So we can, one, make sure we're getting them, because I think there were situations when we came on board that we were supposed to be getting stuff for like Christmas 1 and Christmas 2, and we weren't seeing anything, but we didn't know it because there was no spreadsheet to tell us that they were doing what they didn't need to come in. Well, that's my question, just because I don't understand what's got in front of me. No, no. Well, I don't mind questions at all. I thought you were going to say, I don't understand it either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be honest, if I, if I don't have an answer for you, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, what you really miss is when she's talking accounting language and I'm talking budgeting language. Because they're different. Mm -hmm. And then we're trying to blend the two to get at something, and then we really have using ourselves so much we're like what and, and then then we can reconcile back to okay you're saying you're speaking accounting i'm speaking budgeting and then we get to the point where you ask be right because you should never operate out of an accounting document you should operate out of a budget document and um I mean, we had that problem here at the city where the accounting was kind of you had the budgeting documents, but the numbers were really the operations. And it should be flipped. Operations should dictate it. So we're now, she's got a lot of things that we can see. I think we confuse each other. <laughs> so, Kendra, on this sheet, it just seems to me in the past that we used to have all of the properties listed. Yes, that's, that, that was my bad. As a boo-boo on my part, I can assume. Well, oh, I thought they, they were all up to date. And... No, <laughs> I wish. Um, this was, I moved LHDC's oh. report yeah. uh, just to check over, and LHDC only had small range of spring creek um, parcel in the last yeah. So that, I can send that out to everybody on that one. I saw that when I only saw four, so it's not the one. Oh, somebody's going to question that. <laughs> <laughs> I would. <laughs> Uh, okay. Really low well balance there. Yeah. I know. I thought, my gosh, we've gotten caught up on every other single place, you know. I thought that was exciting. <laughs> um, Sarah. All right. Let's go call for service first. Um, actually, I'm pretty, pretty impressed. We only have 10 of the suites. Yeah. Over the last month, and there are a couple of disturbances and more trespasses. Um, that's not including like our follow ups and more stuff. So, um, Zinnia had 10, and then they had um, so when someone registers as a sex offender, it comes in as a call. So, we had five register. Um, so, right now, I know we have five there. I'm sure we have a few more. Um, AMN only had two calls, AMSA at zero, Watch at zero, Marston at zero, Village on Main at two, um, one was a death, that was actually yesterday. Um, What's the other one, the fall? Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. But so that, both medical. Yeah. Um, Brian at two, Fall River had four calls, two of them were deaths, unfortunately. What was that? Fall River had four calls and two of them. Oh, good, good. Yes. And then Spring Creek has zero. Um, so pretty good. So good. We had um, the bathrooms at AMSA and Watch cleaned last week, so they're full, they're open because they were contaminated. Did you use that? We did. How did it work? Good. <laughs> good. Which, we'll which we're in we're trying to use at the suites. So we're getting we'll a highlight of all we're gonna use now. Yeah, it's just gonna be a clean. And how long does it take? To clean? Yeah. yeah. So it depends on what's in, uh, the, in these bathrooms, it was just the vent system. So they just went in and sprayed the foam, uh, okay. let it sit there. For how long do they let it sit there? 15, about 15 minutes, and then they clean it out um, with a shop bag. 
so these bathrooms and walls were, you know, the walls were kind of just the mess. And then it was good news on Fall River, it was just needed clean, no people. Um, yeah, that's it good. Um, so this phone stuff is interesting to us. Um, talked to this group or was it the council? Yeah, yeah, both. So, that's so fascinating. <laughs> if you want to look, so the company is called Intelligard. Intelligard, Intelligard was out of Brookfield. They sell, they sell the stuff to vets. Yeah, it's game changing. Okay. And so we're going to be watching it, and then he works with companies that use it. Mm -hmm. So and that's the, the company that came and did that. Yeah. In terms of the it's basically um, it's a very high level of peroxide. Is what. The company told them, not not until the dark. He he doesn't want to release his secrets, but the company that's using that product said it's a very high level of peroxide. So, um, and a few other special things, probably. Yeah, that right. It's all about duration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so once you so you said it went well. So you basically used the product and then did like an additional test just to see how well it works. We have to take. Go back do the test, and then once we know that it's under 0.5, we can open the unit, open the bathroom, whatever. Let's get it. So we're we're wanting to find one where there's carpet because that's the one where apparently you when we were talking about you spray the heck out of the carpet, you let it sit, do its thing, then you come in with like a shampooing machine or whatever and then you really work it in let it do its thing and then you start pulling it all out and we just fortunately haven't had one but that's where we see it but then he explained the drywall piece to us which to me that's the game changer and the, it basically soaks through the drywall and soaks into the wind into the wood so that that's what's cleaning it up and uh, is it like through paint too, so it's able to move out? The paint will literally slush off. I think you showed the picture. Yeah. It just starts. So you have to retexture and paint, but retexture and paint is not. Yeah. <laughs> so as soon as we start finding that this works, we're actually probably going to talk about it in Sarah's other side, playing more tenant alliance because. We actually have them, the company's coming oh, cool. tomorrow night yeah. to our train to give a training on their product. And so if anyone wants to know. No, no long term effects on the drywall itself. Deteriorating. Yeah, Not that they've seen them, they've been using it for several years. Where's at least 10 years. Where's the training? It's at the senior center tomorrow night, it'll be at 6 30. The only other thing that we had, uh, you know, next slide was going into Fall River and Spring Creek. I just got an update from John. It sounds like they're still working on it. Um, this is the boosting for their cell, their cell phones. At this point, they, they just have the first floor at the Spring Creek, though. And so I'm going to contact Anthony in our next slide connection and find out. A hold of this. It could be product because I know they're getting off cable for some time. But so that's at least in it's moving. That's all I know. Uh -huh. Cows. Sorry? Cows. Cows. So um, we are just very very You're quickly, close to the finish line. Very quickly pulling the trigger to, we have to basically purchase everything by the end of the summer. So the board will next week approve on some of the ARPA funding that's needing to be used to move forward. And so we have all of our numbers in and the contracts are basically ready to go next week to the board. Um, and then at that point, Kendra and I will diligently spend the money Pay, pay a couple companies to to do their thing, and then we'll, we'll get. Um, it's going to it's going to be an LHA staff decision on what properties we want done first um, for camera systems. And he's in 
Um, and we did include the suites. Um, we actually included all the properties, even Briarwood. Um, so, and that's using different funding sources with the hard work. And I confirmed with um, the installer and contractor at Zinnia that their system should be able to also be pulled into the VMS if that is a decision that um, wants to make. So that we can. So when you say it has to be taken care of before the end of December, do you mean it actually has to be on site, physically on site, or is just a cover? We just need to purchase it. Cover. So okay. I know that the uh, inventory, I mean, that's part of what Everon's job is, is making sure that inventory is there. Mm -hmm. So they've, they've been working on that. So we're putting about 151 cameras across our portfolio. Mm -hmm. And then they, um, that's going to depend, depend on Ball, um, our installer, but I think once we, we saw how quickly the VOM went up, it depends on some of the properties are going to need cabling, like the suites. Um, some of them will not, so it, it really is property dependent. And we might, you know, again, internally we need to discuss which property we want them first versus last. So, okay, Harold. You've covered it all. Yes, I guess. Any questions for me? Okay, other businesses. Do any of you guys have any questions? Thoughts? No complaints? If not, I can work on Jen. I need a motion to adjourn. Melissa and uh, Glenn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not too long here. <laughs> All right. We will see you guys in December. Bye.